Hello everyone and welcome back to Prestige Reef. A couple of weeks ago I posted a video of my Bangai Cardinal breeding experiment. If you haven't seen that video yet, it might be wise to go back and watch that one first before you watch this one. To quickly recap, I'm raising Bangai Cardinal fish entirely on frozen food from day one. I've had mixed results from this previously, but I did have some success with my small scale experiment. I'm now looking to fine tune the process and scale it up by using my old jellyfish tank from Cubic Aquariums. The reason I'm using this tank rather than a normal tank is because it's designed to keep jellyfish. Jellyfish need to be kept off the bottom of the tank, therefore a small pump creates a current around the outer edge. In theory, this should keep the frozen rotifers suspended in the water column as well. Bangai's feed from the water column, and while I was feeding frozen to a previous batch, it would sink to the floor and the fry would ignore it. There are two issues with this. Firstly, the fry don't have access to a continuous food source. And secondly, the large amount of uneaten food would sit on the base of the tank and decompose. In a small tank, this would rapidly pollute the water. The first thing I did was plumb the jellyfish tank directly into the main display tank. This significantly increased the water volume from just 20 litres to 1020 litres. This allowed me much more room to manoeuvre when it comes to the filtration and water quality. There was a slight issue though. I had to set up a tiny return pump in my sump and then guess what to set the flow rate to so it wouldn't pump too much water into the tank causing it to overflow. This was a steep learning curve with two significant floods. Once dialed in, things got a little easier and as long as I didn't touch it, it was fine. I was now ready for my next batch of fry, although I expected there to be a delay. My male had been separated from the female for a couple of months to give him a rest. Once the male has finished incubating the eggs, he is starving. The female, however, has been eating his share of the food for the last three weeks and is almost ready to spawn again. Despite being in very poor condition, she will start to put pressure on him and more often than not, his instincts will take over and he will accept the eggs. This can be very dangerous for the male as some of them would rather starve than swallow the next generation. Having had their time apart, and once back to full health, it would appear that they were desperate for each other, as just two days after being reintroduced, they spawned again. It was then a waiting game. The fry hatched two days earlier than usual, which wasn't part of the plan. It was around 10pm, and rather than keeping the fry in his mouth as he had done every time previously, he decided enough was enough, and he started to spit them out one at a time. I just happened to be walking past the tank on my way to bed and although the lights were off, the ambient room light cast lots of tiny shadows on the back of the tank. At first I assumed it was something else, but on closer inspection I saw the male acting unusually. Then in front of my eyes I watched him spit out a couple more fry. I grabbed my net and I started to scoop up as many as I could. They were pretty easy to catch as they seemed disorientated from being blasted around by my MP40s. This worked in my favour as they hadn't yet had time to seek shelter. The male continued to spit them out a couple at a time for the next hour, and in the end I collected 35 fry, all perfect miniatures of their parents. I poured them into the jellyfish tank and went to bed. The next morning they were all clustered together in a shoal for safety. I have previously created a fake sea urchin for them to live in, but I didn't want to add anything that might become a food trap. This is easy to do using some black cable ties and milliput. It was then time for the moment of truth, feeding them. With all the optimism of a new parent, I defrosted a cube of rotifers and poured it in. One by one, each of my newly adopted children ignored the food and allowed it to float directly past them. This was both good and bad. The flow was working and the majority of the food was being kept off the bottom of the tank, but the fry were ignoring it. I wasn't too disheartened, as I had partly expected it. As the fry were released early, some of them still had their yolk sac. This, I assume, prevented them from being hungry. I repeatedly fed them multiple times over the next 48 hours, but it wasn't until day three did I finally have success. On the third day, everything was completely different. The previous day, I had had a few tests of food, whereas that day, almost all of them went for it. The great thing about using rotifers is they are orange. This made the stomachs of the fry orange as well, making it very easy to tell which fish were eating things were starting to look pretty promising. As predicted, the water movement was triggering a chase response from the fry. The only issue I was starting to notice was that some of the food was beginning to collect on the bottom. 
This was creating a nutrient problem. To combat this, I threw in a couple of hermit crabs to eat anything that wasn't eaten. Things appeared to be going smoothly until day 10. That was when I decided to do a head count and found I had only 28 left. Some of the fry had disappeared without a trace. Naturally, my first assumption was that the hermit crabs were enjoying bite-sized midnight snacks, so I removed them. I thought after I did this, the problem would go away, but I was wrong. Each day I would count and each day the number would drop. It isn't uncommon for Van Gogh Fry to randomly die from a condition called Sudden Fright Syndrome. This is where what appears to be a completely healthy fish will randomly die and is believed to be linked to nutrition. It happens while feeding live brine shrimp and it appears that it happens while feeding frozen rotters as well. I changed their feeding to include lobster eggs in the afternoon while also mixing in some coral food and the death stopped. I'm not sure if this confirms a link between nutrition and sudden fright syndrome as it usually doesn't affect all the fry in one batch anyway. Unfortunately, the waste food around the edges started to collect again as the hermit crabs were no longer in the tank. This meant I was siphoning it out multiple times a day which was counterproductive as my aim was to make the process of breeding bangais as simple as possible. I wasn't defeated yet though, I have another idea which will make the whole process simpler, but you'll have to wait until the next update for that one. I hope you enjoyed watching the video, please feel free to leave any questions in the comment section below. Have a good week and I'll see you next time.